Hello, and welcome to Solutions for Wastewater Pollution, an Ocean Sewage Series video podcast brought to you by the Reef Resilience Network in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. During the podcast, we will take a deep dive into two of the case studies featured in the Wastewater Pollution Toolkit. The toolkit is a series of web pages featuring the latest science and strategies to help marine managers and practitioners address threats from ocean wastewater pollution. The toolkit includes case studies from managers, which feature different challenges and innovative solutions from locations around the world. These case studies illustrate that there is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to mitigating the impacts of wastewater pollution. To identify what strategy or wastewater treatment system is feasible for a location, it is important to identify local constraints, including geography and cultural needs. To learn about wastewater pollution challenges in the Dominican Republic and Cambodia and what systems were implemented to address them, Reef Resilience Network Manager Kristen Mays spoke with Carlos Garcia of the Nature Conservancy and Dr. Tabor Hand of Wetlands Work, two wastewater pollution case study authors. To see one of these emerging management solutions in action, we're going to visit the Dominican Republic to learn how constructed wetlands were used as a nature-based solution for wastewater treatment. We're grateful to be able to learn about this work firsthand from Carlos Garcia, Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy, Dominican Republic. Welcome, Carlos. Um, if you could please introduce yourself and share a little bit about the location of this project. Thank you, Kisun. My name is Carlos Garcia. I'm the Program Manager of the Dominican Republic uh, from PNC. And today I'm delighted to share with you the experience that we have developed with our local partners, uh, Jacques del Norte Water Fund, uh, Asociación para el Desarrollo, APEDI, and Plan Jacques. Uh, using a nature-based solution approach for wastewater treatment throughout the Cibao Valley and the northern shorelines of the Dominican Republic. We're talking about the constructive wetlands, as you mentioned, it's a biological wastewater treatment technology designed to mimic processes found in natural ecosystems, which also enables the community to engage directly in the solution and contribute for the better management of the waste in a whole. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about the ocean wastewater pollution, the problem that you were trying to address um, with this system? Yes, of course. Uh, most of the water here in the Dominican Republic and in many other countries is used in agriculture. Uh, but we have a very in high inefficiency in our irrigation system. So much water is wasted, is discharged back into the streams uh, from irrigation. And it's usually high in dissolved solids, pickle coliforms, nitrates, phosphates, pesticides, and herbicides, you know, all this kind that uh, is uh, coming from the agricultural fields. Additionally, households and medium and small towns discharge waste to soak pits, septic tanks, but very often directly into the proximate water bodies, uh, which uh, finally goes flowing all the way to the shorelines in the streams affecting mangroves and coral reefs throughout the, the countryside and the, throughout the coastlines. The near future um, forecast for Jacques del Norte Basin uh, estimates that the deficit in water quality will remain. So water flowing into the ocean will keep negatively affecting impact in the coral reefs in coastal ecosystems. So that is an issue that we have to address. Thank you. And Carlos, can you share about why a constructed wetland felt like the most appropriate wastewater pollution solution for this location? Well, we have decided uh, because they are scalable solution, they are decentralized and cost effective options. That's key elements for decision making processes. Also as a constructed facility, you can engage other stakeholders to the job, to the process. 
and they will feel represented as well. So it's not just that the community can provide some work, but also other stakeholders that are sensitive to this uh, issue will be able to work and contribute to the solution. Uh, additionally, constructed wetlands do not require energy or chemical supplies to operate and make the um, purification process. It's, it's let the nature work, it's as simple as that. So all are very effective uh, and key elements for this decision. For our reef managers who aren't as familiar with the constructed wetland, can you describe what one looks like and kind of what goes into creating one? Well, uh, essentially it's, uh, it's a pond where that you dig in the ground and you fill with uh, uh, sand and, and small keys. And on the top, you will place some microphyte plants and you make all the wastewater flow into this pond. The, you will let the water remain there for uh, several days or weeks, depending on the size and the um, estimations of the flow. But the process, the roots will suck up most of the contaminant pollutants because uh, the, the plants will uh, use these elements as uh, nitrate and phosphate as element for growing. And as a result, the water will flow with a diminished, very high diminished area of uh, contaminants. Wonderful. Would you just share um, how successful implementation has been so far? Analysis, we found that the waste reduction for organic pollutants is probably from 90 to 95 percent effectiveness. So uh, organic waste and nitrogen phosphate is, is very uh, highly diminished just because of this natural process. Uh, they also have a physical retention process and a septic tank before coming into the wetland. So at the end, you have a double uh, treatment effect. Uh, this is the way we have been working. But we have been able to make like 16 uh, wetlands from different sizes throughout the country. Uh, most of them inland, and I will tell you why later. But as a result of that, the Ministry of Environment itself is requesting also assistance to build these uh, constructed wetlands in um, marine mammal visitor center uh, near a mangrove area. So they have seen the effectiveness and they have requested TNC and the local partners from Yaque del Norte and Plan Yaque assistance to, to make a new facility for this visitor center. So it's, it's creating traction as well. That's exciting. Um, yeah. Okay, and it sounds like this is relatively new project, but but just so far, what lessons have you learned along the way? And maybe well, you take your greatest lesson. Yeah, uh, but let me tell you, uh, to make you some figures, we are now, we all, only these 16, we are treating like 66 million gallons a year of water. So it, it's not much considering the, what the river Jaca del Norte uh, flow, but it's something that mm, start mm, getting bigger and bigger and it's getting more attraction and attention from decision makers. So it's, it's that's it. So, and regarding the, um, the lesson, well, you know, um, most energy is put into restoring shorelines and protecting marine ecosystems, sometimes overlooking that due to the fact that we are small island nations, what happens inland, upstreams in the uh, countryside, in just a few days, you see the degradation. So the environmental degradation impacts coastal ecosystems throughout sedimentation. So we necessarily, at the level of the Caribbean islands and this uh, vision approach, we need necessarily to focus on a 
source to see approach because uh, sometimes uh, precisely because of the size, we don't have much space available near the coast to build those facilities and we need to move forward upstream to, to try to keep the uh, sedimentation uh, in the upper side of the watershed. So it's necessary to have this vision. So rich to reef is also called. So that's for mm, the biggest decision, uh, the lesson learned that I have mm, to share with you so far. Thanks, Carlos. Yeah, I've heard Ridge to Reef, but I haven't heard Source to Sea yet. That's, that's a new, yeah. I like that. Um, so thinking about our you know, marine managers and practitioners who may be interested in assessing if a, a constructed wetland is, is the right solution or management option for them, can you talk a little bit about um, what social and ecological characteristics you've found to be essential for constructed wetland for, for our managers considering one? Well, yes, uh, we also need to include here uh, bureaucratical layer because uh, this approach is new and there is no permis permission uh, methodology for that. So the Ministry of Environment is struggling. Every time that we are going to build one, we have to ask for a waiver because there is no, this is a technology that hasn't been used uh, and we are now uh, trying to, to uh, now that the ministry is engaged, that is also requesting, they have made the second request to build a, a wetland. So I'm positively sure that they will develop their uh, rules and regulations for the construction so everything goes more smooth and easy in this uh, sense. Uh, on the other side, uh, I mentioned before that these solutions are cost effective because we usually get donation from the land. So we don't have to buy land for that. It's an issue for household, for family, for small towns. Everybody is concerned about pollutants in the water and the risk of getting ill. So everybody will make whatever it's at their hands to assist and help in making solution possible and feasible. So we wish we usually get uh, donations of land to make these uh, facilities. But in the coastlines, in the coast area, that's another story. The, the area is a scare. It's more expensive because of the tourism development. So it's not that usually uh, and not that easy to, to find uh, and sometimes we really lack space because as I mentioned, it's a pond in, uh, and before you have the septic tank, so you need some area and it will be impacted if you need a parking lot or whatever other facilities. So it will compete with other elements of a project or facility. So this is something that uh, is struggling and creating some uh, also headaches in that regard. But at the end, the fact that people can get involved either by donating resources, money, so financial resources or natural resources like land, uh, more impoverished towns have committed so far that they have provided hard, uh, so handwork. So they have made the, the ponds, the pits and the, everything, the excavation, the whole process hand and so we can share. So this comes from all levels, uh, positive and not so uh, negative uh, situations, but provides a wide variety of elements to make things uh, possible and makes everything is uh, really that this way is a very positive uh, way to, to make things better. Thank you, Carlos. And just thinking about, and so those feel like a lot of social characteristics, but are there any ecological characteristics of a, of a space that really are very obvious or come to mind 
that make a place appropriate for a constructed wetland? I mean, you talked about the, well, go ahead. <laughs> well, well, yeah, you, you need to have the space, but you also uh, need to make the, we use gravity uh, instead of pumping because we need to, we try to keep at least uh, energy efficiency or uh, in the pencil of self-efficiency systems to build. So the ideal place is uh, an area where you have the source of pollutant in a higher elevation than the, where the pulse is going to be uh, installed. And that way, everything flows down through the gravity and the system works perfectly. Uh, most of this uh, also is, is usually the, that's the, the thing because uh, at the end, usually the water flows back into the streams or the rivers. Uh, sometimes you don't have a space and then you need to, to have a, a pit and, and let the, 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 the water go into the aquifer, but we make sure that the water quality is within the boundaries set by the Ministry of Environment or even better. Well, congratulations, Carlos, for, on the project and to you and, and all the partners and your team. It's really exciting and especially exciting to hear about the traction um, on the various levels within the Dominican Republic. Yeah. So very, very exciting. Um, thank you so much for sharing about this project. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, to our managers, please visit reefresilience.org to read the case study about the work that Carlos just shared and learn more there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting and having us today. Goodbye, everyone. And now we will visit Cambodia to learn about Handy Pods, a three container system designed to capture and treat human waste from floating households or structures. We'll learn about handy pods from Dr. Tabor Hand, the founder and director of Wetlands Work. Tabor, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. If you could please introduce yourself and Wetlands Work and share a little bit about the location of this handy pods project. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, hello, my name is Tabor Hand. I am uh, the director of Wetlands Work a very small social enterprise based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, um, working on sanitation, innovative sanitation designs uh, and uh, scale ups for very poor communities, many of them fishing communities um, and uh, places that have not had access to sanitation because of the high water issues. Tabor, if you could, can you just describe the environment that the project is taking place and tell us a little bit about what that landscape looks like just for background or in context? Yes, certainly. Uh, I, let, me, let me paint the picture of the, the landscapes where, we're, where we are working. Uh, the Tonle Sap is uh, the largest lake in Southeast Asia and it is significantly flood pulsed. Uh, the, uh, Monsoon rains from the Mekong River watershed make the water rise from about one meter in depth up to about eight meters in depth, or up to uh, maybe 28 feet in depth. And the, this causes a huge inland wetland uh, floodplain zone that the people living in floating houses have to contend with, and they keep moving their houses maybe eight times a year. Uh, and it's a zone where for these floating communities, as well as for the stilted houses in the floodplain, uh, do not have any appropriate sanitation. Pit latrines just don't work. Uh, so people have been practicing open water defecation uh, forever, and they have no alternative. And that's where the wetlands work handy pod comes in to provide them an alternative. Can you talk to us specifically about handy pods and what specific wastewater pollution issues or challenges the, the system is trying to address? Yes. Uh, there are three particular 
pollution problems uh, that we are addressing. One is the very, very high pathogen levels of E. coli in the ambient waters of these lakes that cause for Cambodia the highest infant mortality rate and the highest child stunting numbers. Every man, woman, and child has a diarrhea event at least once a month. The second pollution issue is that this open water defecation causes very large anoxic or oxygen-free dead zones. Um, and this overwhelms the critical larval fish habitats that are so important for the overall economics of the fisheries. Um, this is also, these dead zones have led to lower aquatic biodiversity and lower fish uh, productivity. So the third pollution issue is that these ambient village waters are significantly odorous. And this is not conducive to favorable ecotourism reviews, and it's not conducive to the government plans for expansion of this se sector. Would you mind explaining um, to our viewers how HandyPods works? Yes, the HandyPod is basically three, uh, three 300 liter, 250 liter containers that uh, water flows through from the pore flush of, from the toilet pan by gravity from into the first container where the sludge uh, tends to build up. And then it moves into the second container uh, as an overflow and has uh, that container and the following container after that, the third container, have significant surface area inside them that are the uh, home for the bacterial biofilm that develops. And this is what is actually uh, breaking down the complex organic molecules and killing out the uh, pathogens largely by competition, some by predation, but it's, it's largely a competition issue of different uh, bacteria and virus and fungi and uh, microalgae that would be uh, growing within this, this container system. So the discharge that comes out does not have uh, pathogens nearly in the amount, it gets reduced by about 99.99% or four log orders of reduction of the E. coli. And the fecal biomass is contained mainly in the first container and doesn't get out into the waterway to cause the biological oxygen demand problems that we'd normally have. The uh, first container with a sludge buildup after about three to four years needs a fecal sludge management protocol, which we've developed that is very, very simple uh, and involves uh, shallow ditches that are about three meters long. This is for a single family house, about three meters long by 40 centimeters wide and 20 centimeters deep. And uh, then we cover that sludge back over with the soil and leave it for one year, and then that, uh, that sludge is basically cured and is available as a uh, soil supplement for home gardens and such. Tabor, can you share why this technology is the most appropriate solution for this location? Yes, certainly. Uh, first of all, there's no appropriate and affordable sanitation technology that's been available for high water areas in developing countries anywhere in the world. Uh, wetland worked handy poop pod is low cost. It's between $90 and $150 for a single household. Uh, it's very simple. It has no moving parts. It needs no basic main maintenance other than the fecal sludge management. Uh, all materials uh, in Cambodia and in Myanmar are locally, regionally sourced. And it has a uh, treatment efficiency of about 99.99% removal of the E. coli pathogens. 
also, it's very easily replicable by Butlin's work trained local and independent businesses that we create. Can you talk a little bit about how the project has gone and, and highlight some of the successes that you've seen so far? Yes, um, for, for Cambodia's floating villages, we have developed um, a, a unique and, and what appears to be a very successful marketing strategy to introduce sanitation to these very low income, low hygiene awareness remote villages. This has been demonstrated now in 10 floating villages in Cambodia in 2016 and 17. Uh, yet that program did not provide for multi-year support of the local businesses and these businesses were not sustained. Uh, presently, we are funded for three years to promote sanitation awareness and demand in several different Cambodian floating villages with an emphasis on training, professionalizing and supporting the local businesses over a two to three year period. This is not a pilot program, rather it is a true scale up for the long term. Thinking about our the network's audience of marine managers and practitioners, what do you consider to be the greatest lesson learned so far through the Handy Pods work? Yes, the the greatest lessons that we've learned are three. One, keep the tech simple with little to no maintenance other than fecal sludge management. Second uh, lesson is base the toilet marketing on aspirational and convenience issues. Uh, this generates demand more than talking about health issues. And the third lesson is that Households must always pay at least 25% of the cost, even if subsidies for very poor people are available, uh, they must pay something in order to be uh, invested in it, in order for the household to keep the toilet pan clean, to repair the support structure if it gets weakened in a uh, large wave event, storm event. Uh, and in doing the three to four year fecal sludge management protocol. Those are the three main lessons. Thinking about our marine managers and practitioners who may wanna apply this technology in other locations, what social or ecological characteristics do you consider most critical to using or applying this technology somewhere else? Yes. the the. The locations where the handy pot is most applicable include floating, flood prone, high groundwater clay soils, and mangroves and sandy beach areas. Uh, mangroves tend to have stilted houses, sandy beach areas uh, might be, say, a tourist site, um, the bungalows. Uh, the most important social elements for the handy pot um, are where tend to be where people are practicing open defecation uh, or where the pit latrines are inappropriate. And the major san sandmark issues or sanitation marketing issues become first community awareness of an alternative and uh, as well as their willingness to pay for something that has always been free. Um, that's, that's a major behavioral change challenge Tabor, do you have any ongoing research that would be useful for our marine managers to hear about? Yes, we have designed a sanitation treatment system for beach areas and uh, say on tropical islands. And uh, our plan is to design it such that a bungalow, like a guest house or an individual house would have a handy pod that is adapted to remove all of the, or 95% of the fertilizing elements in the wastewater discharge, the nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and we would do that by either adding aeration uh, to blow off the uh, nitrogen with, uh, as an N2 gas, or 
to have it go through a small uh, sort of impoundment or constructed wetland that might only be uh, three, say three cubic meters in volume. It is a gravel bed wetland uh, that holds, holds the discharge water and has plants inside the ground growing out of the gravel uh, and the, uh, the removal of the phosphorus and the nitrogen from that, we would expect to be about uh, 90 to 95% as well. Um, so uh, we think that we can make this so that it is uh, affordable and practical in tropical zones. The, uh, keep, we want to keep the discharge, especially the nutrient rich discharge out from the uh, out of the groundwater and it, on an island, in the water lens, and out of from going under the beach and into the mid tide zone area into a, a seagrass bed or a nearshore coral reef where the epiphytes would be uh, growing because of the nutrients. And this, this is particularly appropriate for some of the tourist beaches that we find in Cambodia where we can see that the seagrass beds have been uh, diminished significantly. And there's a lot of epiphyte in the coral reefs, largely because of the, the guest house bungalows and, and such that, that they have septic containers, but they don't maintain them. And the wastewater just flows right under the beach and out into the, the tidal zone. Um, the handy pod is also very appropriate for the mangrove areas, whether they're mangroves that are going up a estuarine river or on the coastal sort of uh, leeward side of an island. Um, the handy pod works well in terms of removing the biological oxygen demand and about maybe 20% of the nitrogen. Uh, and the pathogens are also diminished significantly. Uh, but the constructed wetland for uh, a mangrove stilted house is uh, less appropriate than it would be for the beach side, mm -hmm. largely because uh, the mangrove areas are uh, much tend to be a little bit lower and more flooded by the tidal zone and the, the king tides and such. Those are that is our. Our goal is to move into the, the tropical island uh, treatment system so that we can uh, have something that, that uh, supports the seagrass beds and the nearshore coral reef, as well as uh, provides cleaner water for the, the people who are swimming in the nearshore water. Well, we're certainly glad to hear that and the, the movement from lakes to coasts for, for the Reef Resilience Network. So, Tabor, thank you so much for your time um, and for sharing about handy pods. We really appreciate it. Um, and for everyone else, please visit reefresilience.org to read the handy pods case study and learn a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. We encourage you to explore the Wastewater Pollution Toolkit and to join the Reef Resilience Network Forum to continue the conversation about ocean wastewater pollution. The Network Forum is an interactive online community of reef managers, practitioners, and experts from around the world. We invite you to join and to ask any wastewater-related questions. Big thank you to our case study authors for sharing about your work, and thank you all for watching.